invite you to stand. Uh, things are going to look a little bit different than what you might be used to this morning, but we have a treat for you guys. Last night, uh, we had one big party. It was just this amazing... Uh, youth outreach that took place on campus, and we just figured on the heels of that, it would be kind of cool to give you a little bit of a taste of how worship went. So would you give a loud round of applause to our Cornerstone Youth Worship Team this morning as they lead us? Where's all the high school middle students at? Excuse me for a minute, but I've got a song to sing. And it might not be on key, but it's from my heart. And no one else can tell it what the Lord has done for me. And this might take all day, so I better start right now. When it might get loud, Come on. Hey, hey. it might get loud. Heaven's coming down. Empty praise 
And treasures that fade are never enough Then you came along And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Come on, can we lift our hands and sing? There's no
Sing I'm not enough I'm not Father, today we thank you so much that we just get to gather all together as a family in Christ, Father. Lord, first and foremost, I thank you for the amazing things that you are doing in the next generation today, God. We know that big things are coming for these students, for the middle school, high school, for the young adults, God, for, for the elementary students. We know that you have amazing things in store for them, God, and for us in this world. God, we thank you for what you're doing in the lives of our hearts. Lord, I pray for every heart in this room, God, just as they walked in here this morning, whatever they're carrying on their shoulders or on their hearts, God, Lord, I just pray that they can understand that you are here right now, Lord, and that you will continue to meet them over and over again. Lord, your word says that you will never leave us, nor you will never, ever forsake us, Father. And just help us be reminded of that as we go through the rest of the year, God, as we go through things in nature, God, as we go through things in our family. Lord, we just ask that you keep us safe, 
but most importantly, we ask that we are guided by your peace that passes all understanding. We thank you, God, and we pray in your name. Amen. Come on, let's give him praise this morning for all the great things that he's doing. Amen. Hey, before you have a seat, go ahead, and this is what I do in the youth. Give somebody a knuckles. Cornerstone, how you guys feeling today? As you can see uh, by the screen uh, behind me with that video there, one big party was off the hook last night. We had 350 students on campus. We had 85 volunteers, and here's the coolest part. We had 45 students make commitments for Jesus Christ. Come on, that's worth being excited about, amen? Well, maybe you are, uh, maybe you've been coming to Cornerstone and hanging out for a while and you're trying to figure out what is your niche? What's kind of the place that God uh, has for you to serve? Maybe you haven't gotten plugged in yet. Uh, speaking from experience as a long-term or a long-time youth leader and as a youth pastor for a time, um, I can tell you some of the most rewarding moments for my life in ministry were serving with middle school and high school students. So if you're looking for a place to get plugged in and that's something that maybe God's pulling on your heartstrings today about, text the word youth to the number on the screens and our youth team will hit you up and get you all of that information. Um, if it's your first time here, we just wanna say welcome. Uh, my name is Aaron and I am the worship pastor here. And uh, we're just stoked that you would choose to spend your Sunday during Hurricane Hillary with us. So uh, congratulations to those who came. Uh, if you would do us a favor, text the word new to the number on the screens and we want to uh, send you a little something for hanging out with us. We wanna send you a gift card to Starbucks just as our way of saying thank you. Uh, if you have any questions about Cornerstone, anything that we do here, as a church, we've got the new here. Typically, uh, the new here table is set up at the gazebo, but because of the weather, they're out in the lobby, but they would love to answer any questions that you may have about our church. Can we just hear it for all of our first time guests that are hanging out with us today? Well, one of the ways that we worship the Lord here at Cornerstone is through our giving. We've got a bunch of different ways you could do that up on the screens, but uh, we just wanna say thank you for being so faithful with your tithes, with your offering. Um, it's, it's what helps us do what we do here as a ministry. It allows us to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our community and across the entire world. So uh, from our church staff to you guys, we just wanna say thank you for being so faithful in your giving. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus. We're, we're thankful for this uh, amazing opportunity to gather um, in your name that we could come and worship you. We can lift up our voices. God, we thank you for, uh, for your safety and your protection over us uh, with all the weather stuff that's taking place, uh, those that would be affected by it. God, we just ask that your hand would be on them. And God, as we give today, we ask that you would just bless this uh, offering today, that it would go to further your kingdom. God, speak to us by your Holy Spirit and through your word today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said Amen, amen. Come as you are, just as you are, it's time to come home out of the dark. No need to hide, he already sees Don't be afraid To show him your face He won't turn you away He'll never turn you away Everybody needs, everybody needs Everybody needs, save. 
this morning and we believe it in our hearts come on we say what you did on the cross still saves us saves us saves us there is power in the name of jesus 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 what you did on the cross still saves us saves us saves us there is power in the name of jesus
amazing. It's a powerful video and a powerful reminder of Jesus and his goodness. You guys can have a seat. Oh man, I'm glad I'm not preaching today. I would just be crying the whole service to you. That wouldn't really help you at all, but God is good. If you're a, a parent in here that has middle school or high school youth, please get them to youth group on Tuesdays and on, and on Sundays when we have service. God's doing amazing things. Our youth pastors are men of integrity, and we're really glad about the, the fun the students are having, but the, the clear gospel and discipleship that it's, they're experiencing as well. Well, I needed another 15 minutes before I was done healing from my back surgery uh, a couple weeks ago. And so I'll be uh, launching a new series next week called Flipped, the Upside Down Kingdom. We're going to be talking about the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter uh, 5 through 7. And so I'm really excited to jump into that over the next 12 weeks. We're going to be going nice and slow through Matthew in that portion. But today we have our newest pastor who's going to be preaching. His name is Wes Sabio. He's been a friend of mine for about 10 years now. And let me give you the best reason why you should listen. It's not because you're in church, not because Jesus is watching. It's his birthday today. It's, he's preaching on his birthday. You would be the worst people on the planet if you didn't listen on his birthday. I mean, what the, that would be a horrible gift to give him. Let's not do that. And so uh, after this video plays to introduce our, our last time in the Win the War in Your Mind series, then please join me in welcoming Pastor Wes Sabio with an applause. Not now, after the video is done playing. Everybody. Good morning, good morning. Good to see you guys despite the weather outside. Kind of crazy, just a little bit, but uh, the Lord is with us. So that's what we're trusting in today. Uh, like Pastor Andy mentioned, my name is Wesley. I'm the newest pastor here on staff. And I oversee our men's ministry, our evangelism initiative, um, our workshops and classes, and as well as our newly formed sports ministry. And so if any of that sounds interesting to you, um, I'd love to connect with you. Shoot me an email, find me after service, and we'll go from there. Um, it's my privilege to get to speak this morning in part two of our Win the War in Your Mind series. And I'd like to just dive right in and read our focus passage for today. And so if you have your Bibles, please open up to Psalm 23. Psalm 23. If you use the Bible app, go ahead and swipe to Psalm 23. Um, and if all else fails, we'll have the verses up on the screens for you or you can follow along in your church center app. So, follow along as I read aloud. Psalm 23, a psalm of David. He writes, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is God's word. Let's pray one more time. God, we're so grateful to be here. And God, we're so grateful for Jesus. And he's the reason why we're here today. I ask, Lord, that you would speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit. You would illuminate the text that it might be alive for us. That it would be food for our souls. God, I know a lot of us are going through some tough times today. And I pray that you would comfort your people with your word. Thank you, Lord, for who you are and for what you've done for us. May I speak in a way that is clear and helpful, but most importantly, in a way that is faithful to Scripture. We trust you with this work, and we pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
Man, well, last week we had Pastor Wesley Town down from the Bay Area kick off this series, um, and he basically spoke on how to care for hurting people. Who was here last week? Okay, yeah, praise God, it was a, a timely and powerful word. He basically showed us the value of presence and understanding and listening and love, and he clarified that during times of trouble, that people need those four things the most, don't they? And so he clarified, and it was really, really helpful. I, I, I took a lot away um, from that message last week, and today I want to continue along those same lines and go further into this topic and look at what I've titled the message, How God Helps Hurting People. This psalm is near and dear to my heart, one of my favorite portions of scripture, and so much so that it's actually our family psalm. Um, there should be a picture of us on the screen. There they are, so pretty. My wife, Brittany, and daughters, Cana and Mercy. Um, some of you guys have a life verse or maybe a life passage, and we wanted to one-up all of you guys, and so we claimed all the six verses here for our family's, uh, family psalm. And every morning we recite this psalm on the way to school as I drive the girls to school. Uh, we started when they were both starting TK, and now they're in fourth and second grade. And so the girls have memorized this psalm. My wife and I have memorized this psalm. And our hope as, as parents is that God's word would be so hidden in their hearts that as they grow up, as they live life, that the Holy Spirit will be able to bring these verses to mind when they need them the most. And if you're in the market for a family psalm or a family verse, um, I'm available for negotiation. You can come find me after service. We can strike a deal. I accept Venmo, PayPal, Zelle, Cash App. That's just there for you guys. But in all seriousness, these six verses that we just read were written by Israel's greatest king, King David. And drawing from the treasury of his experience as a literal shepherd of his father's sheep, he offers us these descriptions of how God cared for him and now how God cares for us, his people, as we go through the full range of human experience and emotion. And you might be here this morning facing loss, facing tragedy, facing pain, stress, anxiety, depression, or you might know someone going through a very difficult season in life. And I firmly believe that God is God of purpose, that he brought you here this morning on purpose for a reason. And I wanna highly encourage you guys to pay attention and be open to what God might be wanting to say or show you through his word today, whether it's for you personally or for somebody you know, whether you're here in person or watching online, whether you wanted to be here this morning or someone tricked you into joining them, be open to hearing from God this morning. Well, as we learned in our previous Rise and Fall series, our study through First and Second Samuel, we saw that David lived a very unique life, didn't he? God brought him through some of life's highest highs, killing Goliath, being anointed king, but also, God brought him through some of life's lowest lows, the death of a child, family betrayal. David experienced what it was like to run for his life as a fugitive, sleeping on the ground, hiding in caves, and he also experienced the comforts and privilege of living as the king of the nation. David was a very expressive person who wasn't shy about his experiences, the good, the bad, the ugly, and he recorded the full scope of his emotions through prayer, through poetry, and through song, many of which we have in what we now call the Book of Psalms in our Bible. And it would be nice if we didn't need verses like this, verses like Psalm 23, verses on God's comfort and God's care. But I'm so thankful that God in his wisdom and love takes the time to show us exactly who he is and what he does for us as we walk through life in relationship with him. It makes me think of every time I fly in an airplane and the flight attendant tells us all about the safety features of the plane, right? And they always mention the life jacket underneath your seat in the case of an emergency water landing. 
Um, our family's most recent flight was for a flight up to Montana, family vacation. And sure enough, both there and back, the flight attendant announced the life jacket under the seat. And I hope I'm never in a situation where I actually need that life jacket for its intended purpose, you know. But I'm so thankful that it's there at the very least. And Psalm 23 is a lot like that. The major difference, though, between Psalm 23 and the life jacket on the plane is not if you'll need them, but when you'll need it. The chances of you actually needing the life jacket on the plane is pretty slim, right? To be honest, it's pretty slim, Lord willing. But the chances of you actually needing the comfort of Psalm 23 is guaranteed. And so Psalm 23 is one of the best portions of the Bible that I wish we never needed. But at the same time, I'm so grateful for, because as our lives have shown thus far, we live in a fallen world, don't we? We live in a fallen world tainted by sin. And none of us are exempt from experiencing the fallout and messiness and hurts and pain that sin produces. And so Psalm 23 acts as the best life jacket for when the waves of life try to pull us under. And to kick everything off, David begins with a profound and foundational truth. He says in verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. I lack nothing. And so the overall picture of Psalm 23 is that God is the shepherd who provides for all of our needs. God is the shepherd who provides for all of our needs. Just as a shepherd cares for exactly what their sheep need, so God does for us. And the amazing thing that we see in the Gospels is that Jesus, in John chapter 10, calls himself the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. The author of Hebrews also picks up on this shepherd imagery, and he calls Jesus the great shepherd in Hebrews 13, 20. And then Peter, in 1 Peter 5, 4, calls Jesus the chief shepherd, and so when we put all these passages together, we learn that Jesus, our good shepherd, Jesus, our great shepherd, Jesus, our chief shepherd, takes it upon himself to care for us. In other words, it's a personal assignment that Jesus takes as the main caretaker and provider for all who belong to him. And that's really good news. That is really, really good news. And I think this is something we need to be reminded of today. That Jesus himself cares for us personally. Parents, grandparents, Jesus himself cares for you personally as you care for your kids and grandkids. Students, Jesus cares for you personally as you face the challenges of school day to day. Employers, employees, caretakers, educators, tradesmen, professionals, amateurs, Jesus himself cares for you personally. Jesus sees you. Jesus understands what you're going through. And he is the one who promises to care for you. And the health and overall quality of the flock is directly tied to the care that the shepherd provides. And so when verse 1 finishes with, I lack nothing, this is indicative of an attentive and able shepherd. One who doesn't overlook any details. One who crosses every T and dots every I. And that's Jesus. That is Jesus. And so this complete care of Jesus for us is what we're going to see in the remaining verses. You could say that verses 2 through 6 are an unfolding or an unpackaging of the, of the truth in verse 1. Verse 1 declares that God will take care of us, and now we're going to see snapshot descriptions of exactly what that care looks like. You guys ready? Let's go. The first snapshot description of God's care is that he gives us rest. He gives us rest. Verse 2 and the beginning of verse 3 shows how God provides his people with rest. David writes, He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. 
And rest for the believer is one of the most underrated blessings that God provides. Now, depending on your upbringing and experience, rest can either be seen as something to be valued or something that gets in the way of your pursuit of something else. Some of us, growing up in the United States, in Southern California in particular, have been hardwired to view rest more as a hindrance than a treasure. But the Bible makes it clear in Psalm 127, verse 2, that God gives rest to the ones he loves. God gives rest to the ones he loves. And this rest that God gives us is twofold. First, our souls can rest because our sins are forgiven. Our souls can rest because our sins are forgiven. And isn't this what the gospel is all about? The good news of Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension means that we no longer have to strive for perfection. You and I don't have to live our lives tiptoeing and walking on eggshells before God, trying to prove our worth and value to him. No, God's grace makes us able to walk confidently now, knowing that our good shepherd did what we never could. And now that we've trusted him for salvation, Christ's righteousness and Christ's perfection is given to us. It's credited to our account. Our sins are now forgiven, and now all of God's blessings are given to us in Christ. And we finally have rest for our souls. Second, we can rest physically because we know that our good shepherd is watching over us. We can now rest physically because we know that our good shepherd is watching over us. The prophet Isaiah reminds God's people in Isaiah uh, chapter 40, verse 28. He says this, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. And so now we can stop from our work and delight in God's ability and control. Now, don't misunderstand me. This isn't an excuse for laziness. Instead, it's an invitation to trust. Our shepherd watching over us is not an excuse for laziness. Instead, it's an invitation for us to trust him. And sometimes, stopping from our work And trusting God with the results requires more faith than just putting our head down and making it happen. Now, notice the description of the place that that Jesus brings us to rest. What does it say? Verse 2 says that it's in green pastures and beside quiet waters. In other words, Jesus brings us to a place of relief and calm. It's the ideal place for our souls to be still and know that he is God. It's a shelter in the hurricane. It's a shelter in the storm. It's a place untouched by the stress and pace of the world where we can get alone with Jesus and rest in his promises and be reassured by his presence. And I think that sounds pretty nice. Something I want to mention here are the valuable disciplines and practices of silence and solitude, of Sabbath, and of slowing. And regarding these disciplines and practices, Pastor Rich Velotis, a pastor from New York that I follow, he said this. He said, no spiritual practice can make God love you. It's too late for that. God already loves you, but spiritual disciplines help us to live in God's love and offer it to others. And I love that quote. We don't have the time to explore these further, but if you want to learn more, I encourage you to check out the book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer. One of the best books I've ever read. Pastor Andy led our staff through this book not too long ago. Um, Very, very valuable. So I encourage you to check that out. Now, before we move on to the next snapshot, look at the first part of verse 3 real quick. What does it say? David writes, He, our good shepherd, refreshes my soul. He refreshes my soul. And so even when life beats us up and we've gone through the ringer, our faithful shepherd is able to refresh us and restore us. 
He doesn't leave us hanging out to dry. He doesn't leave us to recover on our own. Instead, Jesus actively brings us back to full health. Jesus himself does this work. Praise God. Well, that brings us to the next snapshot, and it's this. Our shepherd guides us. Our shepherd guides us. Verse 3 says that God leads us along right paths for his name's sake. Just like a shepherd leads his flock to where they're supposed to go, so Jesus does for us. And notice that it's for his name's sake, meaning that his glory is attached to his leading. God's glory is attached to his leading. You could also say God's glory informs his leading. God's glory informs his leading. Because Jesus will never lead us to places of sin. He'll never lead us astray down destructive paths. If we find ourselves there, it's because we've wandered there on our own. Scripture is clear. He leads us into right paths. Other translations say into paths of righteousness for his name's sake or so that we can glorify him. The case has been made that the anchor of Psalm 23, that the gravitational pull of Psalm 23 is right here in verse 3. And that all that the good shepherd does is tethered to this truth. For the sake of his name. God leads his people in righteousness because he himself is righteous. God's leading and guiding of us is a reflection of his character. And now we get to follow in his footsteps. We now get to do what Jesus did, loving people, serving people, and pointing people to God. Our next snapshot is one that I'm deeply grateful for, because during times of difficulty, times of struggle, it's God's presence with us that completely changes the game. Our next snapshot is this, our shepherd comforts and protects us with his presence, with his presence. David writes in verse four, even though I walk through the darkest valley, other translations say the valley of the shadow of death, he says, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What we often experience during times of pain and brokenness is this feeling of aloneness. We feel abandoned and forgotten And the insight that David provides for us in verse four is a truth that we need to hold tightly to during those times. Because although we might feel abandoned and alone and forgotten in our pain, it's the exact opposite of what what is actually happening. Now, to clarify, on the horizontal level, in our interpersonal relationships with people, we might actually be alone and abandoned and forgotten. And that's why we have to remember to be present with people in during, or during their times of pain. But David is reminding us that although people might leave you, God never will. People might dip out, but your good shepherd is ever with you. You guys remember the story of when Jesus told his disciples to get into the boat and to go to the other side? You can read all about it in Mark chapter four, verses 35 through 41. The disciples, following Jesus' orders, get in the boat on their way to the other side. And in the middle of that journey, a big old storm pops up. They experience a massive storm, and they freak out. They think they're going to die. When they call out to Jesus for help, what does the Bible say he's doing? He's sleeping. Jesus is in chill mode. He's taking a nap in the boat. And sometimes when we're going through storms in life, this is what we think Jesus is doing. It's like, Jesus, wake up, bro. I'm, I'm, I need your help right now. But his very presence with them should have been the key for them to remember. The story continues with Jesus finally waking up and Jesus speaking, simply speaking to the wind and the waves and to the surprise of the disciples. And as you're reading, it's, it's pretty surprising. As Jesus speaks, the wind and the waves, they listen. They obey his very command. Everything calms down. It says that the disciples are terrified and they ask each other in verse 41, who is this? Like they knew Jesus, 
but now they're really getting to know him. Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Someone needs to hear that this morning, that no matter what storm you're facing, God is able to calm your storm just like he was able to calm the storm for the disciples. And listen to this, it's not more difficult for him to do so. We're also often prone to thinking that what God did for his people in the Bible was only for those people at that time. Surely, Jesus can't do the same for me today. But the truth of the matter is that God doesn't change. The theological term is God's immutability. God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We need to cherish that truth. We need to cherish the fact that God never changes. And so it's God's presence with us through the dark valleys that brings us comfort and peace. It's his presence with us in the storm that helps us not to fear. It's his presence with us through loss, tragedy, betrayal, suffering that enables us to continue walking, trusting and believing that he will never leave us or forsake us. And what we learn here is our our next snapshot. Our shepherd gives us peace. Our shepherd gives us peace. God's presence through the dark valley brings us to a state of peace where we can enjoy God as he blesses and provides for us. Even when we're surrounded on every side by enemies, our shepherd gives us peace. David writes in verse five, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. The last thing we think of being able to do when surrounded by enemies is this, sitting at a table ready to feast. This implies preparation, intentionality, foresight, and care. And really, the picture here is of an all-you-can-eat buffet of God's blessing, of God's goodness, and of God's faithfulness. Some of us, myself included, are big fans of all-you-can-eat sushi, just this past Friday, and all-you-can-eat Korean barbecue, Gaja in Oceanside, San Diego, okay? Where we can eat to our heart's content and then just a little bit more, right? Where we can kick back and enjoy each other's company, around a table where we can share what's going on in life, where we can talk story about family, work, school, friends, without worrying about anything. And this is exactly the picture of the table that God provides for us. Again, it's the imagery of feasting on God's faithfulness and blessing and goodness. And as we're feasting, notice that he's anointing us with oil and that our cups, it says, are overflowing. That's to say, the blessing of God is on us, and it's so much so that it can't be contained. No, as God's people, we're flooded with God's blessing. It's grace upon grace upon grace that we experience in God's presence. See, our shepherd isn't cheap. Our savior isn't reserved. Jesus doesn't hold back. When God imparts blessings, we can be sure that we have it in full. There's no such thing as partial grace or like sort of forgiveness. We don't experience kind of salvation or a little bit of redemption. No, Paul makes it clear in Ephesians chapter one that in Christ, we receive the fullness of God's riches to the praise of his glorious grace. Praise the Lord. And now listen to Paul in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. He writes, And God is able to make every grace overflow to you, so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. Praise God. And finally, in verse 6, we see the last snapshot. And it's this. Our shepherd's provision is given to us now, and it extends into eternity. Verse six says, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, forever. During times of hardship and struggle, let's preach verse six to ourselves. 
Let's preach verse six to ourselves. Let's actively remember that God's goodness and love are with us. And that finally and forever, one day, we will fully be with God. I heard a pastor one time teach on this section, and he put it this way. If our shepherd had two sheepdogs to help him attend his flock, their names would be goodness and love. And that it's God's goodness and love that are our constant companions through life. And as such, we need to remember that when life gets thrown upside down, that God's goodness and God's love are with us both now and into eternity. And this last part of verse six is what our Christian hope is tied to. We were created to know God, to glorify God, and to enjoy him forever. And the Bible says that in his presence, there is fullness of joy. And so when the psalm closes with the statement that we'll dwell in God's house forever, themes of joy and peace and goodness and kindness and faithfulness should be the first things that come to our minds. Now I know, our present circumstances may not look great at all. We might have more questions than answers. Some of us might have even struggled with getting out of bed this morning, just overwhelmed with a sense of defeat. But we have to remember that our hope is not found in the things of this world. Our hope is only found in Jesus. Our hope is only found in Jesus and in the truth of his word. In Jesus alone can we find true rest. In Jesus alone can we find true comfort. In Jesus alone can we find true peace. And sometimes, most of the times, we need to take our focus off of our circumstances and onto our good shepherd. Get our eyes off of what's going on, the chaos and the crazy, and turn our eyes upon Jesus. One of my favorite hymns says this, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. As we close our time today, I wanna remind you that we'll have a prayer team up front after service. And if you're going through anything, anything, we'd love to pray for you. So please come down. Yes, even if you're up in the balcony, we'll, we'll wait up here for you. So again, if you're going through anything in life, any storm, any trouble, anything, please come down. And now, I wanna close by inviting you all to stand with me. And we're gonna simply read and declare Psalm 23 to ourselves and to each other. The verses will will be up on the screen. All together, nice and loud. Psalm 23, verse one. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray, God. Again, we're so thankful for you. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us here today. And we thank you for the truth and power of your word. By your grace, for your glory, seal these things in our hearts. And Lord, if there's any of us going through a really difficult time, I pray that you would remind them that you see them, that you understand what's going on, and that you would prove yourself to be faithful and good one more time. God, we love you because you first loved us. Would you be glorified in our lives today, Lord? Keep us safe with all the craziness happening outside. Lord, lead us and guide us. We love you so much, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you guys.